Thank you everyone for your introductions and um, I, I too want to acknowledge um, Kenna Bolo who's um, traditional territory where we're, we're having our meeting on as one of the uh, hereditary chiefs. Uh, review of fish plan. Gordon? Oh. Review of fish plan. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll be doing probably most of the talking today, so if, you, if my voice starts to get annoying, I'm used to that because that's the way I get at home. Uh, the fish plan is uh, is attached to the uh, it's on 5B the actual fish plan is about three pages but just for purposes of today we just we'll just look at this the, uh, the fish plan on 5B it's circle 5B <coughs> Protection of fish and fish habitat is integral to Gixan Wilk government. To manage the Skeena River fishery, the Gixan Wilk government will collaborate and contribute to the Skeena Fish Nations Forum, Skeena Watershed First Nations government. This collaboration will result in a new management direction, updated harvest allocations, and prioritized enhancement and restoration opportunities influenced by low water levels within the watershed. This action is required to ensure indigenous people in northwest bc are fish populations which are sustainable for our children and generations to, that fall tasks being completed include we'll engage with uh, technicians such as gwa and uh, maybe mark Wong. Um, these entities will provide all the relevant reports to ensure the gixan will government will make further informed decisions engage with relevant government ministries and BC Fish and Wildlife Association and BC Sports Fishermen. We're in contact with them, but they're not sure if they really want to start yet with the uh, Sealhead, Sealhead Association is uh, in touch with us. And uh, the second bullet there we have today, uh, DFO and BC here. And what we look to do is to uh, engage with the professional services that are listed there. The fourth bullet is to collect and implement traditional knowledge regarding fishing sites, and that's the main focus of uh, this process. How to harvest species within the Gixan fisheries tenure, including preparation, processing, cer certain species and other relevant information to ensure transmission and inheritance of this knowledge, including necessary language. Identify other gaps in policy and management strategies which have negative impacts on the Gixan fisheries tenure. Develop strategies and management objectives and policies including IOC to fill these gaps protecting wild salmon and the rivers. When you review uh, Dr. Godsfeld's material and uh, with the assistance of Ken Rabnett, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of opinion regarding stocks like trout, sockeye, coho, steelhead, and uh, basically not much attention is paid to the Gixan fisheries tenure, the actual fishing sites of the Gixan. And you'll see that in the policies of federal and provincial government that, uh, that that's ignored. And what we look at is developing a fish habitat assessment and monitoring plan. We have, uh, I go to a fish camp quite regularly now for the past five years. And there's, you can see the spawning salmon right out. And that's the main area where the sports fishermen like to, to fish and jump out and walk around in, in the water. And that's just one, one particular fish habitat that we're quite concerned about. And uh, also we, the Gixan have uh, water and fish policy. We will look at all or portions of those. 
and and uh, I'll speak more of that when we get down further down on onto the agenda. So that's basically our fish plan. You'll see that we're not going to fight over whether or not there's enough salmon. We feel that the quota and allocation process is very good for industry. Industry includes the uh, recreational fishermen, and that. Uh, that, uh, that it's a breach of our human rights to allocate us food in the province of BC within uh, the Gig Sand Fisheries tenure. But we'll get into all that. We don't want to have, uh, we just want you to know where we're coming from. Uh, we're not going to hire five biologists and five doctors like Dr. Gottesfeld to argue with you over the amount of allocation and quota. What we're telling you, you is that we have, uh, you meaning this whole group, is that we have a fisheries tenure, which simply stated our fishing sites, including uh, fish camps, and we have families and children there. So you back that up to 1975 when the Department of Fisheries would raid, raid our camps, they would come in fully armed, they would arrive by two or three jet boats, hop off the, their boats with their rifles, kick over camping gear, looking for fish, digging through the camp, and <coughs> there would be probably six fishery officers and about three RCMP, and they did that a number of times in 1975. We had at least 25 uh, chiefs were charged with fishing. So as a result of the fish, the fishery problem at that time, uh, we have uh, GWA, Kickstown Watershed Authority, and they're mainly concerned with fish. They're not concerned actually with the watersheds in terms of how the Gixan have uh, nine administrative watersheds. So you'll see that uh, the concern is still the same that we have today as we have in 1975. Unfortunately, the department has charged a few people in the past few years uh, for fishing our, our own fisheries tenure. So that's the focus. Simgiget uh, and participants here is that our plan is to work based on our fisheries tenure, which is throughout the whole watershed. And I'll close off on that point is that we're not here to argue about whether or not the fish are dying and we're not here to argue whether or not the water is too low or argue about fish fences. We're here to tell you that we have a fisheries tenure that's valid, is based on our law, and uh, we'll see what happens. We, we are basically uh, a competing jurisdiction now, and we would like to figure out ways okay. where, we can, where we can work together. Thanks. Thank you, Gordon. We have a crisis management team that has been selected by the two um, <coughs> groups of uh, get chiefs from the um, we call. We at this point, instead of calling it upriver and downriver, we use our our. Um, traditional ways of recognizing what part of the river on the, on the Skeena River we come from. And uh, we call it Gates and we call it Kigene. Uh, Gates meaning down river and Kigene meaning up river. So we have um, um, a few of our Sydney get here to uh, provide additional comments to what Gordon has articulated to um, to the fish tenure that we we base on our IO, our traditions, our our history that continues to thrive and will never stop. So I I open the floor for uh, opinions on discussions. Uh, we got Vernon and then Robin and then um, Norman. <coughs> Good morning, uh, 
Honored guests, uh, chiefs, um, we have a fishing site in, uh, uh, between Terrace and uh, Kilunga. We've lived on it uh, since I was just a little boy back in the 40s, right up to date. We used to stay uh, uh, on the track site in the place you guys call Ritchie on the map. It's a train station there. And uh, it wasn't just 1975 that the fisheries challenged our, our uh, way of surviving. It's basically, to me, challenging our survival methods within our culture. My mom, uh, my dad lost his sight in the early 50s and my mom was the one that argued with the fisheries back then. She wants us to go by time. To us, we know when to fish and when to pull the net. We have our own certain fishing site in our culture. We don't fish in other people's fishing site. We stay within ours. And I think we have more than a dozen fishing sites along Skeena. Uh, but we concentrated on a couple of fishing sites, one by the railroad track, and, uh, which was damaged by the railroad construction. We moved across to the highway side, and we stayed there ever since. Uh, we moved across the uh, late 50s or early 60s. Late 50s, we moved across there. And we stayed there uh, every summer. We're, we've developed, uh, we've uh, re restored our fish in the smokehouse and restored our cabins there and uh, we've stayed there every summer uh, if my children could fish in my inside my fishing site they have a privilege to do that but nobody else could fish on my fishing site besides my children that's our culture and I, I see these sport fishermen, they, they go all over the place, they, they rate uh, everybody's fishing, fishing hole that week. And we see the damage is done in our fishing sites. We catch uh, uh, plastic bags and whatnot that, uh, that they throw in the water. Uh, I watch news all the time and I see a big whale just a couple of weeks ago, we floated into the, into the uh, from the ocean into the uh, mainland there in Norway, I think, or Norwegian. Uh, just they wondered why he died, so they cut him open. It's full of plastic bags, tons of plastic bags. So no doubt in my mind that our fish eats those plastic bags too. I'm happy to hear that the uh, BC is uh, talking about eliminating plastic bags. Uh, that will help our environment. Uh, we saw the damages on our fishing grounds in the plastic bags. Uh, hopefully, fishers and oceans uh, could uh, endorse the uh, problems in the federal in, in, uh, implement a new policy that uh, they don't uh, issue any more plastic bags or sandwich, ziplock bags, you name it, it's in our river. But our main uh, focus is we'd like to protect, uh, I would like to protect my fishing sites, uh, more than 10 of them, and uh, because uh, in our own traditional law, I can't use somebody else's fishing site. Whereas I see you sports fishing, recreation fishing all over the place. Thank you. Thank you, Song Hee Ho. Robin?
like to thank the um, honored guests for being here today to listen to what we have to say, um, listen about the facts and uh, our way of our way of life. Um, when we start uh, fishing in the beginning of the year, um, we usually have our our feasts and we share and our catch amongst our families and their friends. We were never told when we were allowed to fish, to go out and go out and fish, how long our net is, how deep our net is, how wide and whatever. We were, how, we were never told how long we were allowed to stay out there on the fishing grounds. We were never told in our days how much we were supposed to take because we were taught by our ancestors what we to take what we just need and if we have more than what we need we would give to the others that are less fortunate. We also had our smokehouses along the way with our fishing holes. Fishing, fishing, uh, the smokehouses right along our, our sites, right, right there we fished. And then uh, after the highway and the CNR came through, it became harder to access to the sites. Lots of fishing holes destroyed damaged we as first nations have always relied on our fish our way of life our food chain it identifies who we are we have our history stories about our fish dances and songs these stories go back hundreds of years we ought to have learned in our laws not to play with our fish. Why? We'll get punished. And there are strict stories that say why to re respect our fish, our wildlife, our land. It all connects to who we are. And the highways that you see today, it is our trails. We've walked those hundreds of years ago, horses to get around, canoes. We never had to answer anybody how to live to get from A to B. Who developed these lands and before the Umpsiwa? Who looked after these waters, fish? Who looked after the wildlife? We are one with the land, the fish, the wildlife. They are, and the land is one with us. This again identifies who we are. From the first day of memorial up to these modern days and age, we are still looking after. Our laws still exist, it still works, and we still abide by it. Not only us need to respect the laws of our ways, the non native need to listen and respect our ways. We as, as First Nations have abided by the white man laws for years. Now it's time that the government listens to our laws. We are ta also taught as kids, as young men, not to talk back to our elders, especially when we talk about our laws, not to trespass another chief's territory fishing holes called respect. If we needed to go on another chief's territory or fish site, we'd have to ask for permission. It still exists today as part of our law. I believe as far as communications go, the government needs to help us identify who we are as First Nations to respect our, and that applies to who we are, our crests, our stories, our blankets, our land says it all. Why do they call us First Nations? 
were here first and we are here to stay. And, you know, that's that's what I I jotted down last night thinking about who we really are. This is who we are. We look after our land, look after our fish, we look after one another, we respect one another. That's it. Thank you, Skin. Norman. Um, okay, uh, Gordon mentioned um, uh, people being charged. Um, uh, okay, I I have always been an advocate for um, for justice, and um, if the DFO says. Um, you're not allowed to sell fish. I just set that aside, and I sell fish. Therefore, I was charged. I was charged many years ago, um, and through technicalities, I was, uh, the charges were dismissed. I didn't use I didn't use my rights at that time. I, I didn't say it's my right to fish. I, I was just, um, I just know that our people are being oppressed. Um, and many, many of our people have been uh, charged. One of them is Vanderbeet, um, that, uh, that woman that was charged for selling 10, was it 10 fish? That's ridiculous. I find it, I find it so ridiculous that white men, white men can come onto our territories and charge our people for using their resources. There's no economic basis um, for First Nations to um, get their livelihood from. And um, we live on marginalized reserves, of which, of which is what the government wants. They want us to be dependent upon them for everything that we get. They want us to line up and uh, ask for, beg, beg for every little thing we get, including organizations like this. We beg for every little piece of uh, everything we get from, from the government. That includes money. We're all lined up. <coughs> That's ridiculous. DFO operates um, on policies, and um, everything they do <coughs> is through policies. Um, and I find, uh, you know, this, uh, these the policies that they're using is not law. Um, so th there's a lot of uh, gaps within their um, within their laws. Um, okay, DFO says, uh, you know, since I'm talking about charges, that um, these policies and the laws that we have today are reflections from the cases that our people went through. One of them is Sparrow. And that was just, uh, you know, using uh, what we have adopted from the white man. Because our law, uh, the, way, the way of life of the, uh, the Gitsan, we adapt, we adapt to everything that surrounds us. And that includes the onslaught of the white man. We adapt to them, and uh, before the white man came, we did get our fish from the rivers through our own. You know, we call them bana. It's basically um, a, a fish trap. But today we use um, nets, and in Sparrow, they said. We're sorry, but your net is too long and too deep. So 
you are being charged. So from that, we got our fishing rings, sparrow. And uh, when you think about the reflections that the, the DFO gets from these cases, there's another case that's called uh, Gladstone. In that case, our people, um, they got uh, the right to, to sell um, herring eggs. I don't see the right to sell what we have here on the Skeena. We don't have that right. So where are the reflections that they get from, uh, from these cases? There's none. We still, we're still being oppressed. So the uh, DFO, as I said earlier, has laws, and there are gaps within these laws. Uh, and these gaps allow for their friends, through lobbying efforts, to come into government and lobby for what they want. These friends of DFO are corporations, huge corporations, billionaires coming in, and they, they manipulate the law. They're the ones that are calling the shot. They're calling, you know, they're operating the government <coughs> because of their money. Look at that big scandal that is happening with happening with um, uh, Jody Wilson Rebold. There's so much cover up within government; it is ridiculous. And if you have an Indian in there in government, you're gonna you're gonna have people like Jody Wilson Rebold coming in. You come in with your own beliefs, the, the, uh, the Git Sam uh, and uh, Jody Wilson Rebold. Honesty, integrity, and the government uh, cannot stand this. They cannot stand honesty. So what does the government do? They're trying to pu uh, push her around in government and saying, you're gonna have to toe the line and do what we say, otherwise, otherwise you're out. You know, she was probably threatened like that. She didn't toe the line, so she was kicked out. She was fired, that's what it was. So um, this is what our people are um, fighting today, the oppression. We should be allowed to manage our own fisheries, and I mean our, our fisheries, because it is ours. This land is ours, and it's time, time that DFO and the uh, BC, for, uh, BC uh, government recognizes our rights. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Please give me new. Guests from the federal government, BC government. The reason why we developed this crisis management is because of our fish tenure. For years, the feds mismanaged our fisheries. I was a young boy. My grandmother used to go to the canneries every summer, spring, summer, right to fall. Sometimes we stay through all winter because she works in the cannery doing different species like crabs and halibut. And there used to be 24 7 cannery opening. That's how much fish there was. 
I'm just starting the confluence of the Buckley schema. Pink salmon used to be like that. That's what they mean, you could practically walk on them. We never used to go home, we'd yak one, roast it, and stay there all day if we have to. And what Robin and Vernon said, we were taught never to waste nothing or play fish or any living being, animals. During the fishing war, they call it, when they're charging a whole bunch of natives, they set up entrapment. People go around entrapping people, pretending they want to buy fish. As soon as one person gives them one, what are their names on there? I was caught up with three of those because I was guilt by association. We had to go to court, but eventually the judge threw it out because he knew that it was wrong. But the point I brought this up, every time I had to go to court, I have to miss one day of work. You are not reimbursed. Sometimes the court case goes all week because there's so many charges. They used to come up the river to cut off your net, to fishicate your fishing gear on top of the charges. When we first started this, that's exactly what you hear around the table here. We are just going back to our old original ways, re-establishing the Kitsan governments. And this is our first priority because our fish is disappearing. They have all mismanaged it for years. Totally. And every time there's not enough fish, even down the Fraser, oh, the Indians, they blame the Indians. To tell you the truth, I don't really like the word Indians. Who is Christopher Columbus? Was he a white guy or a Spaniard? That was his mistake. I keep telling my friends here, we're not Indians, we're good son. We're unique. And as you heard earlier, we have our own laws on the Lahib. Nobody can trespass in your territory or there's consequences. And when the government issues license permits to go fish anywhere, that's trespassing. We're not going to accept it anymore. I don't know what the consequences will be if they keep coming on there. But we'll figure it out. Like the government, you should take away your fishing years, etc. But we're not really that vindictive, but if Push come to self, it's hard to see. Spawning grounds, as you heard, has been wrecked. People walking around on the riverside. I know I'm not supposed to really mention outside what we're going about. Seeing that the most of the skin is one of the biggest problems we have. It's my last few years 
I was supposed to have my own boat, but I quit going to the Henry when I first saw the Shanes going in there. And I knew it, that's trouble. And then I heard they're saying in at the Babine Lake. I kept asking why, nobody knows the answer. Oh, there's too much fish overpopulation. And I asked, who counted the fish 100 years ago? And say there's too much, they'll find their own way. People way down in Ottawa, Victoria, telling us what to do. Hardly any of them ever come up our territory here to find out what we're doing, how we're living, how the fish migrate. So they start using the fish fence. And some people, our own people, are asking, what, what good is the fish fence? I can't remember whether it was you or one of you who tried to explain. It took 20 minutes. Still didn't get an answer. Money. I think that's just a waste of money, but the government's always good. We've been repressed, repressed for over 100 years. They say being wise is going away, it isn't. It's getting worse. And we're going to see that this year when the recreation and fisheries and all these guides start coming after us. That's when we have to be united. And if the government only quit handing out permits, Fishing lights be less trouble. Smithers said they lost $25 million. How much do we lose each year by not allowing us to fish? That's our staple for thousands of years, fish. And they're taking it away and now this. I heard uh, Morristown hardly got any fish. Even down a freezer. I know I'm going out of line with this and the government allowed the fish farms to come in. Or well, we got our own scientists, but scientists from other countries who had fish farms. I read about those. Their river is dead, there's no fish in them. That's what we're up against now. It's not just now, it's over 100 years ago since BC joined the Confederation Dominion of Canada, your guys' language. So that's why we're on this fish tenure. And what I want to find out personally and the rest of the group is what kind of chemical is the CN using spraying the right of way? damages the fish. And I don't know if the forestry still does that in the forest. They used to spray the young trees while they're replanting. Another thing we want to see is enhancement, fish enhancement. Kishbyox has one, but it's usually the first one to be set down as it's our native land. So we're fighting against everything and what the government does. That has to stop. We have our own laws. I keep telling my negotiators, you gotta teach the government. We have our own laws that has not been extinguished. It's still there and some of them are more stronger in the European government we're under now. It can't be just one way, oh, you guys gotta do this. A 
that's what I told one game warden on my territory. He said, you better get out there. He said, what authority do you have? He said, that's mine, my territory. You're trespassing. So the sooner we start on this, it will be better for everybody. We're willing to work with you people. It's not this one way like you guys keep telling us what to do earlier. The fish, uh, wreck the fishing run, hope we get can and go in the big rock. Nobody fished there anymore. And they promised to give, bring up fish from the coast to the native people in here. I haven't seen it. Too many broken promises. And I want to tell you guys, we are not passive. The get sand people are not really that passive. We can talk. You want to work with us? Good. But like I said, if push comes to say, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we're getting too aggressive, but better shut down. Thank you. Thank you, Nisi Minu. Before you speak, Art, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, I have to leave. Um, thank you for hearing me out. Uh, I have doctors. Very important to my health. I appreciate for all of you listening. Thank you for your We will keep you filled in on the rest of the proceedings. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge the local chiefs for allowing us to be here and uh, And I think I am glad to be one of those chosen to sit on this table, and, um, and, and I think it's, it's it's a real honor to to have our elders uh, point us out to to bring the message to to all of you, and um, and I think we always look at ourselves as. Um, decision makers, we look at ourselves as the persons who, who look after the laws of the Gitsan and, um, and, and I think for the longest time we have, um, we have cooperated um, and at the same time uh, over our lifetime we watched the system dying in front of our eyes and, uh, and I think it's getting so bad that, that, that we have to intervene and, um, and a, lot of, a lot of times um, our own people come against us because they feel like we're not doing enough and, uh, and, uh, and in, in a lot of cases we, we, we try to cooperate and uh, and because that, that's what they expect of us. Like, um, and, but I think when um, a certain uh, health of the river is on the line, then, then, then we begin to have a collective stance as all hereditary chiefs that, that we have to we have to bring our laws into force and that and that was why we say no sports fishing in 2019 and um, I think
think a lot of it stems from um, our beliefs that we don't play with fish. We, that that was just something we don't do, and um, and I think from watching the whole system in my lifetime. Um, that the comments that the people used to make was um, they watch the pinks go up the river and we don't see very many of them now. But, um, and the, the common common statement back then was we can walk across the backs of that fish, they say, and we don't see that anymore. And, um, I guess I'm, I'm kind of lucky to participated in the commercial fisheries in St. Lucas, North Pacific Academy, and um, <coughs> I started fishing there when I was 16. And, um, and, and I think the fishing was good, but I think some of us seeing what was coming. Um, a lot of a lot of the fishing looked good, but we knew there are some weak streams, there are weak spawning grounds up there um, that, that the people are picking up at the coast, like uh, there's nothing that's marked on the fish that I'm going to this weak stream, like they get all picked up anyway. And, um, and I think <coughs> this is why our thoughts back then was we need to uh, influence inland fishing. So so <coughs> if, we, if we are fishing in the weak area then we just don't fish there. And where where, where the fish are strong then that's where we fish. And, uh, and so I think um, I think what we want to do is implement the strength of our laws because um, because I think for the last 10,000 years plus, um, all systems were strong. All systems were strong because we have a set of laws that that govern our people, and uh, and we do, we don't change the laws to accommodate any special interests. We're we're um, I think our laws don't work that way, and. Uh, and so I think um, seeing the, the whole regime uh, going downhill, then I don't, I don't think we have any chance but intervene. And, and I think that's what we're doing. It, um, <coughs> it, it's almost a now or never thing. But, um, I think. Uh, I think when when I look at my age, and I'm 71 now, and, um, and and I ask myself, how can you not do this? And um, and I think uh, for the people that we lead, they expect us to look after the livelihood of the land, and um, and, and if we don't do that, then um, and then we're not doing our job. And, um, and so, <clears throat> I remember my aunt, she's in the middle there. She was the lead, lead plaintiff in our court case. And, and uh, I remember the day she said, when she last talked to me, about her speaking out of the grave, she said, and she was trying to impress on me that um, that that we have to have a bigger influence. We and I think it's it's not a nice thing. Thing it's a, it, it's a thing that we have to do. But, um, um, so I think if we get to the point of agreeing of a, a tribunal, then, uh, then um, we could, we could uh, put
put in management ideas that work and, um, and I think there, there are certain things that might not continue but um, and there would have to be reasons to justify whatever decisions we make and um, I just want to um, thank all of you for being here um, like um, I think with with our nature we, we we don't believe in kicking people around uh, uh, but but I think we there comes a time where we have to be strong and uh, and when things are falling off the rails and we, we have to step in and uh, uh, and implement our laws and where, where, where other people's laws come in, then we can talk about that. Anyway, thanks for listening. I, I'm grateful for you guys being here. And I think, I think we can do something. <clears throat> Thank you, Wilma Golds. Now, last comment. Robert, just a uh, quick comment. I just want to mention Years ago, we used to barter with the coast people. That brings the coast items like seaweed and all that. And they get moose meat and whatever comes from here, and then the government stepped in and stopped that. That was one of our uh, own coast calls. And as people used to come in and uh, sell seafood this way, then the government they stepped in and stopped that they started charging the people from the coast. I don't see what the reason was, but that's the one that's control, I guess. That's that's been our way of life. That's why we're so adamant adamant that we start this, uh, continue with this in the, with the tribunal too. That's all I wanted to bring up because I forgot to bring that up. Thank you, Robert. I just wanted to add a couple of comments um, from um, what I grew up with. We maintain our fishing site for long before I was even big enough to run along beside my grandfather who um, took care of the site when I was young because my uncles were working and every morning five o'clock six o'clock in the morning grandfather would come and knock on our door and uh, give my mom one egg for her to cook for me. She would cook it for me and then off we go to uh, our, our fishing site, which was about, we measured it out by using the gate warden's vehicle at the time to measure how far we walk every day while during the summer and um, our site was kind of unique in the early part of the season fishing season a small bay um, with rocks on or not rocks but like a part of the mountain that's uh, it's solid rock beach and in order to get down to the, walk down at least 150 feet to the river we would have a net set across probably from here to the end of the table it's a small little site we used in spring but boy it would it would be very very effective 
So as a young child, you would have me run around these rocks while you said, well, you go back up to the hill and come around the other side, untie the net. After a couple of times, I was looking at the rocks around it. I think I could go around that way. So we set the net again and uh, then fish hit the net while we were setting it. And he said, just, just wait. And we take it off, untie it, and I hold it in the room while he pulled the net in and take the fish off. <coughs> I, I remember that because the importance of how long we have done that. I could go on and on about the stories that he, he did with me as, as a young child. And, um, and I, my, my uncle, uh, we, his name is Renault, but we called him Tubitz. He was... <coughs> A lot shorter than me, but he was husky and uh, and he had a mean streak. Nobody, nobody come to the fishing hole without him knowing about it. And he found out you're you're in trouble. And we have ways to deal with people who, who steal from our fishing site. And it was well known within our community how much, who he was about. And he, he showed the people that this belongs to Weir and Hantu. And uh, people really recognize that. Really recognize the authority we have on our anat, our unusual. Much of the information that the chiefs have brought up are very clear and concise on our yoke, on our, our, our law, on our fishing sites. And we, we, we take care of what we have. And as Simpy Get here, I've pointed out key areas sure you've all taken notes and see Colin's got two and a half pages going here and I uh, really appreciate that because it, it, it recognizes the importance of what we have to say and what we have to do about our fishing tenure. Our Anat, our Loop Sahun, our fishing sites, our smoke houses. Canneries. We call them canneries because we have family members processing the salmon. We put them in jars and we put them or, or, or we can them. A lot of us, a few of us have hand canners where we just crank every can one at a time. And we'll have another person check and see how is that can good. And then we process it through our pressure cookers. And before we had pressure cookers, I remember my mom used to put this big, very blue, blue container where we put fish in jars and, uh, and uh, we had an old stove outside, outside, literally outside the house like a regular cook stove and we throw wood in the fire and boil the, boil the, boil the fish for I can't remember how many hours but that stove would go at least three for three days as we take one batch off and now we put another batch in taking care of all of our families that's our process you know, that's never changed. We still have, now, now we have smoke houses in the back, in our backyard because of what has happened so often. And uh, the, some of the chiefs have echoed, well, 
they don't have a camp anymore. The railroads have, have pushed it out. The, uh, the access is no longer there. We also have uh, fee simple lands that, that block our access to, to our fishing sites. You know, and we even have our own reserves that block our access. So no, you can't come there. I've been involved with uh, with also with fish hatcheries. With, um, my friend here, Colin, was a part of the Salmon Enhancement Program we had years ago. And our community thrived and uh, really, really enjoyed the work that we were doing and restocking our river. Maybe that needs to happen again, which is a thought that has popped up today. But I just wanted to share with you the, the importance, the, the uh, what, what the chiefs have echoed today on our fish tenure. It's, it's, it's not small potatoes. It is huge. It is our livelihood. We've done this for thousands of years and we'll continue to do it for many more thousands of years. But if we don't take what a friend of me said, don't take the bull by the horns, or you're going to end up with the tail because it's going to run away from you. So at this time, as the chair and as the province or the DFO um, to comments, Colin. Um, so uh, I ask for your patience as I try to work through some of the the comments <coughs> and, and things that. Uh, that have struck me, and and then I want to kind of, after making a few comments, get back to Gordon's point about the fish plan. So, it to me it it is important to um, let you know what I was hearing from your comments, um, and uh, what what I see is some of the really important lessons for us for our discussions as we go forward. And uh, if I was to try to think about all of the different things that were said with real um, passion and meaning, uh, I think Chief Brian Williams' last comments really capture a lot of it. What I was hearing from all of you was about your tenures and your culture, the Gitsan tenure and the Gitsan culture and the importance of that um, today because of the concerns that you're facing today. And so, um, and, and Robert also talked about the, the importance of bartering in the past. And I think that's a really important point and and Art spoke um, about many things but he was talking about the responsibility to look after the land and the people and and I heard that several times from different people um, and different that she's were talking about uh, we're the stewards of the land and we have responsibilities and they're tied up in our laws and and we need to incorporate our our access issues to our to our laws and so I heard that several times and I also heard themes like Robert said several times um, he talked about the challenges with DFO in the past several of you did 1970s and um, Norman talked about uh, you know the the laws uh, and interpretations of the laws and I work for Department of Fisheries and I'm a senior manager. I, there's no denying that history. I I can't um, I can't do anything about that. That's that's part of what's brought us all here. 
I acknowledge that. And I acknowledge there's impacts on all of you all the way through that. Um, but we do need to look forward. And as so many people talked about, we need to deal with today, and the fish numbers are down. People said that in different ways. Um, it's not the way it used to be. We've got these challenges today, but we're willing to work with you. I heard you say that. We're willing to find a way to try to, to deal with these issues. And, and, um, and that's where we're at as well, you know? Um, you know, Vernon was talking in the same vein about it's really a fight for our culture and uh, um, and talked about impacts that have occurred over past the railway, the highways and then he brought it back to the fishing sites and the tenure and the importance of accessing so these are the messages we're hearing and we've looked at the agenda and I I appreciated what I learned last time I was here. I was really here just to kind of listen and understand where you were coming from and so forth. And the themes we've heard and, and you know, the, the focus was on not a great long list of issues, but trying to focus on the challenges in front of us around tenure. So I think that's really an important point where we start focusing back and I look at all the documentation and, and trust me, I've, I've really looked carefully at the information that uh, has been provided um, and that I've had access to. And some of it's very challenging for, for the government agencies, for DFO. I mean, there's, I, can't, I can't dodge that. Some of the statements and some of the um, directives are, are difficult for government agencies and the department to address. So I'm not, I'm not going to dodge that and we can have conversations about that. But what I'm trying to focus on is the issues we've heard are focused today on the tenure, the culture that's really important to you to incorporate into today's discussion. And, all right, so then I go back and I listen to Gordon's summary of the fish plan. <coughs> and so I'm thinking, all right, the first part of all the conversation there, if you're looking at your watch, it won't be too long, Brian. No, no, no. <laughs> I, will, I will let you know. <laughs> the first part of Gordon's conversation or, or the summary of the fish plan was all about engagement, all right? We want to engage with the technical entities, and I'd like to talk more about that in a minute. And, and, um, and we want to engage with the ministries and we want to look at all the other, you know, sector and talk about the recreational, the conservation coalition and so forth. And, and then there was a bit about information. We want to have the right information on the table. We want to incorporate our traditional knowledge and, uh, and, um, and we want to incorporate information about the Gitsan tenure and the access issue. And then we want to identify gaps in knowledge, gaps in the information. So like this is really logical. We want to get the right people involved in the conversation. We want to get the information on the table. The, we then want to kind of agree on what are the gaps and what do we need to focus on. And, and then we need to develop some, some tasks and actions. And in, in the fish plan talked about habitat assessment monitoring. But to me, I break that down. I mean, that those are two. But like, so what are the steps and actions that can be taken? And, and then we want to try to find ways to implement this because we're all concerned about the fish. So that's my summary of the fish plan. And I say, totally right on. We absolutely agree. These are, these are the key elements of a, of a path forward. So there's a lot we have in common. And if we can acknowledge the past and put it there, I understand that's what is a part of your existence today, but that's not necessarily gonna help us as we move forward. We've gotta find ways to kind of 
deal with these issues and develop a plan like this that incorporates those elements and helps us move forward. So when I listen to all of you, Vern and Gordon and Robert and Art and, and when I listen to you all, these messages are not um, just superficially, you know, in one ear and out the other. I hear where you're coming from and it's a big deal. I'm not diminishing the impact of the history, but I really hear the importance of this issue of accessing fishing sites and the culture associated with your fishing sites. And, and I've identified some of the direct actions you talk about are problematic for us, but I think we can talk through some of this and I think we can develop a plan that would work. In the course of discussion in the morning, we've got some more time yet. We're gonna talk about terms of reference and I'd like to keep that discussion general to talk about who should be involved in this conversation and how does the conversation need to proceed. And I'm even now going to kind of put on the table, we actually in the department, and I know my colleagues in the province, spend a lot of time trying to do the right thing. We really do. We've got staff, some of Amy's staff, some of my staff, we spend a lot of our time talking to representatives of indigenous organizations, technical working groups, chiefs, bilateral discussions. We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to share information, understand perspectives, and incorporate it in a plan going forward. And more and more, we're trying to get a plan that we all agree on all the time. Like that's, that's our goal. It's difficult because there's lots of perspectives, lots of different chiefs, lots of different areas. So it's a challenge. And one of the things we want to go through at a little bit uh, later is to try to explain the different layers that we are working at in our attempt to try to engage with all of the groups effectively. And by this, at the top of the list is working with indigenous groups and leaders and technical groups, and then some of the other interests after that. So we have a pretty clear idea of the priorities as we go forward. Um, my point again is that, and we'll get into some details, we spent a lot of time trying to talk to the right people, and we're gonna need your help in trying to shape what the process should look like. So there's some. Thank you, Colin. Patty? Thank you, Brian. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank Samiget for sharing information this morning. Um, I'd like to thank uh, as well for the opportunity to uh, to be here to hear that uh, information. Um, I'm not going to be nearly as eloquent as those who have spoken before me, um, but I I do see um, and hear a, a common concerns around the state of the fisheries resource and also access to that fisheries resource, particularly the fishing tenures and the amounts. And, you know, this is um, something that we, we heard about during the Gitsan uh, 101B that occurred on March 15th. And, you know, this is our, our third meeting and I'd like to understand really, um, you know, what information sharing can occur so that we can enhance both of these, the, the fisheries management that occurs and access to the fisheries. Because I believe that there can be um, improvements made to both and uh, systems certainly are not perfect. And uh, you know, I think there's more that we can and should do. And that's really, a, it's trying to get an understanding of what information we can um, gather to, to help improve uh, both of those. Um, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. Um, that's Cheryl for comments. Well, thank you for the opportunity to um, even be a part of this discussion. Um, I'm Tanaka, 
Uh, my territory is in the southeastern corner of the province. And um, since the early 60s, that was the last time that we saw any salmon um, flow through our territory. Uh, the dams came into play and um, shortly after that, the uh, Columbia River Treaty was uh, negotiated between Canada and um, the United States. And uh, we were not, um, you know, part of that uh, negotiation or that discussion. We were not consulted or engaged with when all of that happened. And as a result, uh, we no longer have salmon. And so um, when I'm sitting here listening to um, your concerns about the state of the fisheries and the state of the, um, the resource, the habitat, um, I can feel, I feel for you because um, you don't, I don't want uh, any other nations within this province or within this country to be in a position that we as Tanaka people find ourselves in where a huge part of what was our spirituality and of our culture and our traditions was taken away. So I'm really happy to hear that um, you've uh, been able to create this table to be able to have a discussion in terms of what you're going to do to work with each other um, to make sure that uh, the Gitsan uh, laws are going to be recognized and respected in terms of being able to have a say and a decision in what happens within their respective territory. Um, I'm sitting at a table right now with representatives from Canada and British Columbia where we are talking about creating a BC specific policy that is going to replace a um, certain component of the um, comprehensive claims and the inherent right policy. But first and foremost, the foundation for which that conversation happens is based upon the fact that Canada and British Columbia have both unequivocally endorsed the United Nations Declaration. And that is the basis and the foundation for these discussions that are currently underway. And I think that that's really important for Canada and British Columbia representatives here to um, keep that in the in the back of your mind in terms of these discussions, um, because there the, the um, United Nations Declaration um, clearly states how <coughs> governments need to interact and, and um, have a relationship uh, with First Nations people in this country. So, given that. Um, British Columbia, um, the Leadership Council of which I'm uh, a member of as well, the the executive, uh, the executives of the First Nations Summit, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and the BC Assembly First Nations. Um, when the seven of us come together, we're referred to as the BC First Nations Leadership Council. We currently are sitting at a table with British Columbia, working on how to. Um, develop legislation and implement the United Nations Declaration for British Columbia. And so um, I think that that's a strong tool um, and it needs to be definitely a part of these conversations and it, it needs to be something that BC brings to the table when you're talking about recognizing um, an Indigenous nation's uh, laws and recognizing their lands and their territories and um, the ability to be decision makers, particularly when it comes around to free prior and informed consent. Um, and I know that at the federal level, um, the Prime Minister, he made a commitment about wanting to um, put into place a rights recognition um, framework. Um, we know, um, unfortunately, that that didn't go as planned um, because there were some nations across the country who were concerned about what that might look like and they thought that they might be shortchanging themselves if they in fact followed the path that the federal government was presenting. But it's different here in British Columbia because of the fact that we do have a tripartite arrangement of sorts. And um, we continue to work on developing what that rights-based recognition framework should look like. And when you take a look at, or when you consider about all of the strong cases that have helped shape and form uh, policy and law, the majority of that does come from British Columbia. And so we believe that we have more at stake than what the rest of the country has, and that we needed to be in the driver's seat, we needed to be um, a full partner um, to be able to determine what that recognition rights framework is going to look like. 
We are still pressing the federal government on working with British Columbia specifically, despite the fact that maybe the rest of the country is not interested. But we believe that based on all of the rights and the title that we have here in BC, that we need to be able to have an opportunity to explore what that's going to look like. So there are a number of um, initiatives and factors in play. And I think that um, the fact that you're sitting here um, going to have a conversation, um, I just want to stress the importance and support um, the statements that have been made by the Kitsan leadership here about the full recognition of their rights, their inherent right, and their ability to implement and put into play their traditional laws. And so I think that that definitely needs to be um, on record and it needs to be respected. So thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. As Gord already pointed out, I'll call on him to to review that in terms of reference. Okay. So sad. Are you leaving? Okay, was running away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, the terms of reference are page 2, 2A, circle A in the back. <clears throat> the introduction, the Gixan government fills a gap in the Skeena watershed by protecting the individual rights of the Gixan which are otherwise unprotected in the Constitution of Canada and established this crisis management team to proceed with a shared objective for the 2020 fishing season. The current salmon crisis in the Skeena watershed is exacerbated by government agents opening fisheries to recreational fisheries and its industry. In addition, public fishing permits and licenses issued by government agents in the recreational fisheries trespass on both the indigenous individual rights to the fisheries and on Gig Sand fisheries tenures. Purpose, protect the salmon and habitat in the Gig Sand fisheries tenure and to understand that the salmon is vital to the public interest, including the diet and culture of indigenous peoples in the Skeena watershed. <clears throat> the crisis management team holds an advisory role to the Gig Sand government and others and is established by Gig Sand government. The members shall be representatives of the Skeena First Nations leadership, hereditary chiefs, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, and from both municipal and band councils. The team shall hold one orientation meeting and a number of working meetings to discuss matters relating to a shared objective for the 2020 fishing season. <clears throat> uh, rules, I gotta take a sip of coffee here. <clears throat> the chair of the team will be appointed by the team at their first meeting, will facilitate the team proceedings and ensure all decisions and processes are consistent with all policies, decisions, and Gixan Ayok, including other Indigenous peoples' laws. Team members are expected to attend working group meetings and participate in the process. Members are expected to attend in the or it's supposed to be in, not an. An orientation session to learn about their mandate roles and responsibilities and procedures of the team and have opportunity to review to complete the final terms of reference of the team. Team members are expected to provide feedback on the initial fish plan and terms of reference of the team. The team will provide a copy of the fish plan. Members of the team. 
Uh, we'll hold at least one working group meeting per month to discuss matters related to the salmon crisis in the Skeena watershed. This team will hold additional meetings deemed necessary within each month and within timelines established by the chair. The team will be deemed to be properly constituted even if all members are not in attendance. No quorum is required. Meeting notes will be prepared and distributed to all members at the meeting. <clears throat> meeting dates will, will be established by the chair in consultation with members of the team. And you'll see the fish plan there. Uh, we've sort of started the process. We have uh, Elaine Sampson now. She's, we had Linda Morrison Matthews. And now we have uh, Elaine doing the work for us. And uh, it's easier are basically to get the ball rolling. And, and if uh, Canada or BC feels they have additions that they want to deal with. Uh, just the one point, which is the main issue, we don't want it to be the elephant in the room, and that's the uh, uh, permits having access to our tenure. That's uh, not direct action. Uh, we disagree with you on that. It's, it's, it's a situation between ourselves that we do not trespass on one another's uh, and that without permission. and. Uh, and that in, means everybody. That includes uh, the permits that issued by the province do not have that authority to, to allow trespass. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's just the way it is. And that's what we, I suppose our team here will be focusing on. That's uh, uh, you back that up, that this is not a process where one one party will have the gun to the head of the other. So we'll ask you to take your finger off the trigger, here, Colin. We, uh, we uh, when you call it direct action, then we start thinking, oh, oh no, it's uh, it's going to be. Is it going to be a situation where we're going to have to stick to our guns, and then you're going to get an injunction? And then you're going to get the RCMP to show up, or, or your own fishery officers. If that's that's in 1975, we're we're now uh, 2019, and those days are are gone. So we we have to look at the issues, and uh, that's a gap in your your regulation, your Fisheries Act. That's a gap in the provincial regulations as well, and that's where we fill the gap. So we're we're here to discuss and reconcile. So that's all I have to say about the in terms of reference. They're they're not uh, uh, solid. We can delete some or we can add some more. So it's wide open because it's your it's your terms of reference. Thank you. Okay, the terms of reference, and uh, as Gordon pointed out, uh, it's mainly about uh, you know the permits uh, that are allowed. Um, okay, when I say white people, I, I basically mean government. But when permits are given out, uh, they are given out to white people, not necessarily all white. You know, you know what I mean. They're not. Um, they're not good son. So you have these people coming uh, onto our territories and um, that is trespass. The, the fisheries, which is managed by DFO, has mis mismanaged the fish uh, to the point where it is depleted. And as this lady said, it is our spirituality, the fish. 
It is our way of life. And it is not right that somebody should come onto our territories and dictate what has to be done, what we have to do, and for us to act as good little Indians and toe the line. That's not right. So when you think about permits, who's earning the money? Who's earning the money from these permits? It's certainly not us. It's the government, DFO. And, and this money makes all of them it, 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 they work from this money. Excuse me if um, I get stuck for words, but English is my second language. Um, so um, when we are described as stewards of the land, that is not right. We are not stewards. We are owners of the land. And the fish that come, uh, that come from our land is ours. We should be the ones that should be controlling what happens to our fish. And that includes commercial fishing, sports fishing. So when, when we say that the permits are trespassing, they are, because they are trespassing on our land and they are trespassing uh, on and taking our fish. And you say, well, you know, these, these, the fishermen, uh, the sports fishermen who come, catch, release, they're only allowed one fish. No. Um, it has been, uh, our people have witnessed uh, the white people just pulling out fish, thousands of fish a day. And they're not releasing them, they're keeping them. So uh, the permits are not working and uh, regulations that the government puts on the permits are not working. So um, the, the DFO regulations are futile and continue to de deplete our resources, and that is the fish. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Norman. <clears throat> In uh, Gitsan Ayok, there's no such thing as recreational fishing or trophy hunting. No such thing. We fish for sustenance, our food, same with hunting. And I've seen uh, ample of time just to one step away from fishing where I see game just the head's been taken off. And then recreational fishing, catch and release. Does anybody ever monitor how much of that fish survives? Probably not. Yet they let it go. They say that's a good system. You keep on catching the fish over and over and over again, pretty soon they can't feed, they can't eat. And what happens when you don't eat? You die. Imagine I have a hook in your mouth so many times. That's what happens to our fish, catch and release. They tried it down the coast. They have a special box for a certain, I think it was coho. 
after they've been out of the water so long, they don't survive. It's just like human. See, there's no data on that. Nobody bothered to check on that. And that's the thing that the government doesn't really look at. And what Norman said, who earns the money, that don't really matter because what we're after is replenish the fish in our rivers, re-enhancement, because that's our sustenance. We live on it for thousands and thousands of years. Sometimes we don't even get fish. Because according to my uncle, our fishing hole is way down by the towards the gate there. He hasn't shown it is where it is. So we depend on other people to give us fish. Either that or buy it. Just a few years back, we used to go to the coast food fish. And for some reason, they stopped that too. Now you need permits and everything, just everything's permits to the government. And uh, Collins had just said a little while ago that the government's going to have to look at that. Knowing the government, they take their time. We don't have time to replenish our fish. We're in dire straits now. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, we, we look carefully at the terms of reference, Gordon, and um, and I focus in on the issue and the purpose and who's involved and um, difficult to kind of tie it all together um, but and the reason I say that is the, the purpose is to protect the fish and the habitat and, and the the tenure the successful access to fish and supporting cultural objectives correct me if I'm wrong but, but basically that's what it says and um, the context is, this is an advisory group to the Gitsan government. Um, so my conclusion then is that um, uh, the federal role in this is strictly as observers. Um, it, it, is that, is that the, the, the consistent with your thinking is my, is my first question. Um, and then I'm focused in on um, that elephant that Gordon is referring to, i.e. the uh, management of the recreational fishery in uh, your area. And I'm looking at it in the context uh, more broadly in the Skeena. And, um, and I'm looking at it from the perspective that you guys have described in terms of the issuing of recreational licenses is seen as a trespass on your rights as well as a trespass on the specific fishing site. So um, I, I think that whole discussion it really needs to be um, examined so we can really look at the issue of excuse me, the impact on your rights. Because it's our government prior, uh, you know, policy supported by law that the priority access, after we all agree on conservation objectives, is to provide access for uh, indigenous traditional use, food, social, ceremonial, fishing, in our context around fishing. And so, so that's where 
it's really important that we kind of examine this impact on your rights because um, your ability to uh, harvest for your food social ceremonial purposes um, in a way that doesn't jeopardize <laughs> others upstream of you and so forth is is our business like we we are responsible to try to make sure you have access to do that so that's why it's really important to examine that the the other part when we go to well looking at the the access to the to the site the actual the, the locational aspect of the fishing activity um, if I look at it from the department's perspective, I have to kind of go, well, some of this is outside of our mandate. Some of this is um, uh, based on law in terms of land and ownership and uh, um, access rights through, you know, the railway, the issue and challenges you've raised around that. But it's not necessarily the mandate of DFO. So I'm, I'm thinking about, well, what can we do in DFO, what's in our scope to work with you? Um, part of that is a big picture rights and title discussion, and I understand that you're, um, you know, active in that in that arena. You know, CERNA and the discussion of the federal government and reconciliation and treaties and all of that is is the arena where that is being tabled and work to resolution occurs. So talking to um, you know managers in the department uh, that I have no basis to kind of move forward or make statements or or try to I have no mandate to work and resolve those kinds of issues. But where it gets to be our department's mandate is just as the province issues freshwater fishing licenses to people to recreational fish for um, steelhead and trout, so does the federal government issue permits to harvest salmon in freshwater as well as in marine areas. So this is an issue for you and it's an issue for us. And um, again, in the spirit of looking to what can we actually do in 2019 moving forward, um, I think that there is lots of discussion about what's the first thing we need to do to try to focus on this issue. and. The first thing in the fish plan was all about information. And so there's information on, that, that we need to know. We need to take the maps of the houses and the whelps and understand where they are. And we also need to be able to look at this from our department's role in the Skeena and the North Coast. So we work with the Kitsam Watershed Authority. We have a, an agreement to do technical work with them. It lists all the houses in that agreement. And so we have a lot of discussion with them about technical aspects of resource management affecting the Skeena, affecting this area. We work with the Skeena Fish Commission on a technical basis. We're not su suggesting that there's any kind of bilateral decision-making thing on a technical basis. Collect catch data, we work in funding those kinds of programs. We talk about anticipated returns, we talk about um, challenges in trying to uh, ensure that there's sufficient fish for conservation. What are the, the high stocks and low stocks in terms of abundance levels? What can we do? And we have a broader technical process with the indigenous reps and their biologists and so forth. That incorporates not just Skeena Fish Commission, but uh, Wet'suwet'en and Lake Nabeen and uh, um, the Kitsum Kalem and so all the way down the Skeena and the approach areas. And we have um, repeated technical discussions with those folks, looking at uh, anticipated abundances and impacts and targets and options, technical options in managing other fisheries. Sane and gillnet and recreational fishing in the ocean and in the river. Very difficult conversations, but we're talking about options. And then we try to have a process from the department's perspective. We try to then reach it up. We take these options and we then we, we get some um, feedback from recreational representatives, commercial representatives. We look at the options and then we take them back to indigenous leaderships. and. 
I'm the first to admit that we're undoubtedly missing some steps here, but we do our best to try to go back again and check. These are our options. This is what we're looking at. These are how we're trying to meet our objectives. These are what the objectives are. And we have that conversation. So it's the point I was making earlier. We have a lot of staff working through these processes to try to do the right thing in terms of incorporating perspectives and try to find the, the right management options to ensure that we achieve the conservation objectives, that the indigenous harvesting opportunities are provided in a way that is kind of coordinated, you know, in the watershed or in the marine areas and then in the watershed. Um, so that gets into the timing and, you know, which fish are going by at what time and all of that. And so that's part of this information sharing. If there are, no, I'm not saying if, clearly there are issues with recreational fishermen making it difficult for members of your houses to do their fishing at specific sites. So I think we should start to explore, first of all, exactly where they are and is there a way to communicate broadly to the public and to recreational fishermen so that they are informed, so that they're specifically informed that Kitsap people are fishing in these areas and this is their site and they cannot be disturbed when they're doing their fishing for traditional purposes. And, and it would be a starting point for trying to get the right respect in society for your fishing. So it's a long-winded way of getting back to the terms of reference. For me, it's important that we understand that in these terms of reference, we're not establishing a co-management process where, and, and that, you know, I'm, I would be looking to see where, you know, my minister's authority is in there just as your authority is in there. We're not doing that. This is an advisory process to your government. I think it's important that we think in terms of federal role is really isn't it as an observer in this process so that we understand and I would hope so that we can develop together by better understanding your advisory process how we can incorporate your governance as you've described into our processes so we can do a better job of what we have to do. So um, having said that I, I'm not sure it's our place to comment on your terms of reference. <laughs> Other than to say, I see our role here is to participate from an observing perspective, a learning perspective, so that we can then find the right conversations to build a process to make sure we're talking to the right people when we're talking about trying to do our job. So there's, like I've thrown out several points, <laughs> but it's also in response to the terms of reference. Thanks, Colin. And uh, before Robert and uh, Gordon. Yeah, thank you. It, uh, it was good. It was a good, uh, a good description of the of the situation. Why we're we, why we're here. Your your very limited uh, jurisdiction does cause a lot of problems. And the main problem we have is the gig sand fisheries tenure and access. Uh, you spend a lot of time talking about your technical people. We don't have uh, any disagreement with what you do and what you say. And uh, we can hire. We had Alan Gottesfeld. Doctor, if, if if we wanted to fight you on the data and the technicalities, but that's not our interest. So if you're an observer, then fine, our terms of reference stand. I guess you don't want to comment what would get your interest, so we got past that stage. Uh, when you say that uh, sites 
fishing sites are outside your mandate. That's what we've said, that there's a huge gap. And so you got the, you got the message clearly. You may, you may be painting it a little different, but paint don't matter. It's there. And uh, what you do, you do affect it by your allocation and quotas. And when you tell Charlie, go get those Indians to change the size of their mesh, go get those Indians not to fish on this day. And then all of a sudden, two days later, you open it up to the recreational fishing and say, they can get one, one fish or two or three, but you don't monitor any of that stuff. So you do affect it and you don't need maps. You know what you're doing. You're, you're in total control of uh, Patterson corporations. You're in total control of uh, Smithers and Terrace and Rupert, uh, the recreational fishing industry. When they complain to you, you open it up. On May 27th, there's not enough fish. And June 1st, there's an abundance of fish. You even allow Gixan to have an inland fishery. Charlie runs around and tells people when to open and when to close it, when to buy. He warns his friends when to get ice. You can get ice, and if there's a shortage of ice, then they're told, like Norman mentioned the thing about the uh, friends, the friends of the DFO. So you are, you are at this table and we like it. And you seem to accept the terms of reference because we're here to deal with the terms of reference where there is a gap in your jurisdiction. That's why we're at the table. So it looks like we can move ahead. PC is very quiet. And uh, they're the pink elephant in the room. They issue all these uh, recreational permits. And all the friends in Smithers and the friends in Flinro. Flinro supports a blockade on our territory because it's against the pipeline, which is claimed to affect recreational fishing. So you see all this stuff that happens to us right in front of our faces. So we're here and we're focusing on our fisheries tenure. We have jurisdiction on that tenure. And we, what you say now, it looks like it's competing jurisdiction. So we have to figure out how it is we're gonna work. And you're gonna have to tell the recreational fishermen that they cannot go past Legate Creek and that they cannot get into the Skeena River the bulky river where it touches the Kickstarter territory. And BC is going to have to do the same thing for 2019. For 2020, we're trying to figure out a way. So if you want to observe that, then you will be observing the recreational fishing stopping at our borders. But if you want to contribute to finding a way like our chiefs have said here, we've listened, we've abided by everything for the last how many years? We've faced fishery charges. And when we stand up for our rights, we face armed police officers. So basically you're observing with your finger on a trigger. And that's what we're looking at here. And we're not afraid of that. So that's the picture and what we're dealing with. And uh, the terms of uh, reference here is for now, it says to advise the Gixan government because you have your, your uh, jurisdiction and what you're doing and we have our jurisdiction and let's figure it out.
Okay, pretty good place, Shamalaja. First of all, when uh, Colin set the rule of law, whose law? Federal, D.C., get some? You got to say which law? Rule of law. Because we keep saying that Kitsam has their own laws, it's not been extinguished, it's not been abolished. It's practically written in stone, they call Walhe, and it goes on and on and on. Which the government, if they want something, they go parliament and legislate it. Just like that. For their own benefit. And he also asks, what can we do? One thing you can do is talk. I don't know who is responsible for the sale in D.C. <coughs> or Feds. See if you can get them to stop the same mode's going in the mouth of Skeeter. <coughs> that will be our first request. I don't know about talking with the Babine, doing what they're doing. That's their own nation. As you heard, Jim Patterson owns everything up there. Fishing boats on the coast. So when they enabled to please him, sometimes the government bent backwards to please him. Money. Like I said years ago, the days of buttons and beads are gone. They've tried everything to try to extinguish our culture, but we're still here. We're not going nowhere. And you heard what the fee simple? The federal government <coughs> broke the own law that said there's not supposed to be any more sales of property while well, everything is still going. It has not been settled. And when we say the Skeena, it's not just a fishing tenant, fishing site, it's the whole Skeena, Aliax we call it. And we often said to the government, Kitsan has territory 33,000 square kilometers. Lahip. It belongs to the Kitsan, there's no such thing as crown land. And the way our friend is talking, I would have to figure out the technician can't comprehend it. It's back to your old tricks. Delay, delay, delay. The government works in a snail's pace. <clears throat> Some things they do that just like in the residential. People are dying off. And they're getting less funding, yet they have to sit they have to fiduciary duty to look after natives. We've been burned so many times with the feds. Each prime minister we get in and the PC too. They're just as guilty. Reconciliation. And they do look at my territory. They took half the mountain of logs, I couldn't do nothing. Because they said there is only one chief. Each territory has different chiefs, but the government only recognizes one name. They don't know nothing about our territories. Just looking at the map. And that's what's happening here again. We have to look at technicalities. Just like the Fed Reb said. That's why I asked, why doesn't the minister come up here and meet us one-on-one -on -one as government? The only time we see you guys come up here is election time. 
throw nickels and dimes in front of us and break their promise later. My time's up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Solomon and then Patty, and then we'll go on to the next item. Um, so, Gordon, I, um, I just want to um, clarify, maybe pose a question. If, if, if the intent and the purpose is to protect the fish and protect the access, is um, is this the team you need? Is what? Is this the team you need? Is this the right process, or do we want um, um, a broader table with the same purpose? I'm just looking to see if, in the spirit of trying to find a way to move forward and work together on these issues if we shouldn't have a commitment to try to have a process that um, includes all of those who can contribute to try and find the solutions. And in my mind, that would include um, the agency reps, DFO, we, we issue some licenses, the province, um, and I, I, I'd suggest that maybe um, we need to, and it's again a government perspective, link it up more broadly because it's difficult if, if we were to try to find actions just in your territories without thinking about the adjacent ones, it would, it would I, we don't have the resources, it makes it really complicated and I know complication shouldn't be a deterrent to moving forward but my point is, should we have a broader group, broader representation from the other Kitsan houses, um, agencies, and have some kind of commitment to an ongoing process to search for options and actions to move forward? Notwithstanding your crisis management team as you've got it as an advisory group currently. So, yeah, I, I see what you what the issue here is you're trespassing. We haven't said your technicians are trespassing. But when you issue a license or whoever harvesting fish pursuant to a permit or a fishing license, that's trespass. That's the issue. So how many people do you want to have? It's up to you. It's your, your suggestion as to the terms of reference. What you have here today representatives, three representatives from the Gigani, that's 20 hereditary chiefs. Three representatives from the Gets, that's 20 hereditary chiefs. So you want them all in a room to raise hell with you? That's up to you. If you, if you want to open up the, if you want to open this up. But you gotta get off of your, uh, extreme budget and technicians you have. You gotta step away from them. You have to focus, we suggest, on the trespass and access to the Dick Sand Fisheries tenure. You can tell us there's a trillion fish. We still got the tenure to deal with. We still got trespass. And you can tell us there's only 10 fish then definitely you're gonna have one hell of a time to have access to the fish tenure. So this summer, if you put out the message that fish is closed and there's only so much fish allowed to this person and, and, and so much to the Indians, your access problem increases. And if you lie to us and say there's five trillion fish out there and that there should be no problem to access, then we have a credibility problem with DFO. Because you take a look at the Gixan fishing tenure, you look at our storage, look at our pantry, we have fish there. And you look at our smokehouse, we have fish there. We have preserved fish for the winter. And then you look at Patterson's warehouses in Vancouver and Seattle. How many 
fish, how much are they worth? And zillions of cans of fish stored, hoarding, hoarding, hoarding of fish. While you're saying to us that we have a concern about number of fish. So we can argue all day about those type of things, or we can focus on access to the tenure. Then we're just back down to this table. You're the trespasser, what do you say? The Gixan law about trespass is, what is the value to the trespasser to trespass? What is the value to you? So you, it's still in your hands, you set the value. That's simple as that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Ben? Thanks, Brent. Um, so, um, indeed, I'm being quiet because I'm trying to listen. Um, and uh, my my participation, so the, the th what I bring um, through my participation is I'm, I'm a, a manager for uh, our freshwater fisheries, for wildlife, um, among other things. And I, I bring um, knowledge and, and insights and, and an interest to share that information and also see what information we can incorporate uh, from GitSan that can in, enhance what we're doing, um, uh, and that can occur in many different ways. The discussions on, um, you know, I just want to be clear, and this is something Colin was getting at as well, on rights and title, that is not something I'm responsible for. I want to be very clear about that. Those discussions are held by treaty negotiators with the BC Treaty Commission, and I, that is not something that I do. I do fisheries management, I do wildlife management. Um, so in that context, I want to know, you know, this, this, uh, the concern around the crisis management team, I hear loud and clear that there's cons conservation concerns and, and also there's access concerns. And I think there is things that we can be doing together. Um, I want to make sure that those discussions are inclusive as well. Like the province has uh, tables where some things get discussed through strategic engagement agreements. There's nine watersheds, five have agreements, and I want to make sure that we're being inclusive of those discussions. Um, that's one thing that I would comment on in terms of references. What are the linkages to other processes so that we are being inclusive? Um, you know, Robert, you made that point uh, that there is, um, you know, uh, a need to understand uh, who we're talking to, and I want to make sure that we're talking to, um, it, particularly if we're talking about ANATS and what knowledge we can share with people so they know about ANATS, making sure we're talking to the people that, whose ANATS we need the information on. We, you know, I don't want to be talking about this in abstract terms. Um, so that was, that was one thing. And, you know, I think on the fisheries management side, you know, there is a very conservative regulatory regime for freshwater fisheries management. We, there's catch and release for steelhead. We don't allow anglers to, um, it's catch and release for, tr for char, so for bull choke, dolly barden, and for a, a small portion of the year, we allow anglers to harvest rainbow trout. So in that context, you know, what more, what information, you know, can we, can we add to enhance um, the management that's occurring. If we're missing something, I really would like to know about it. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing I feel, aside from the terms of reference that the province can do, and I was, I was talking with Brian about this, is when, particularly for ANATs that are right, right off the highway, right beside the river, there's not, an angler would not know about it. So how does an angler get to know about it? Is it a sign? Is it communication? How do we increase uh, people's understanding so that they know this is a place that families go to get food? Because otherwise it's left to conflict on people defending their areas and saying, you know, this is important to us and then, the, and then conflict to ensue. But if there's some sort of signage or communications that we can point to, it, I think it can go a long way. And I, I see that as a, a, a you know, an element that we can do more on. It's, um, but I, 
I want to know what the appropriate forum is to have that discussion. Is it here? Is it at the strategic engagement tables? Is it, is it something else? Because I, um, you know, I do have mandate there. I, I want, and I think we should, increase um, knowledge so that our communities can have greater understanding of, of what an internet is, how important it is, and if there's, um, yeah, so I, I think there's things we can do, and I'm, I'm keen to, to explore that. It kind of, it, it's not really getting directly at the terms of reference, but I'm just seeing the next steps of uh, things that we could, uh, could work towards. And on the specifics of fisheries management, there certainly is studies on catch and release and mortality rates, and I can provide information on that. It has been investigated. So I, I, can I, we get that? I've written that. I will provide it. I've written that down, and I will provide that information. I also wrote down the point about getting information about what CN is doing. I will get information on that as well. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but who's doing the monitoring? Who monitor? On uh, fishing. Fishing? You go past Harris, it's just one big lineup all along the river. Who, who checks on them? For, I, want, I want to see data on that. Yeah. For three years, I led a River Guardian project, and we hired, um, you know, I worked with Brian on that. We hired people, we hired Gits and people to do monitoring on the Kispiox River. There is, mo and that's an example of some types of monitoring that occurs. There's other types of monitoring if it's fences to count fish, if it's aerial overviews or other approaches for stock assessment, there, there's quite a bit of monitoring going on. And I'd be happy to share information on that as well. It's not everywhere all the time, but it is happening. How do you do aerial <laughs> You fly over and count people. Don't you shoot a fish? No. I don't want to shot negative, but that's... And anyway, what we're getting at here is uh, you're doing well with your jurisdiction. And, you, and you're right, uh, Patty. We're, we're not disagreeing with how, you know, you do the best you can. You do the best you can with your jurisdiction and with all your technicians and, and all your doctors. And we have our jurisdiction now. And it's very simply stated that there's no access to our jurisdiction. So we have, uh, we have to discuss that. And what could help that access is your stories about the catch and release and how you monitor it. You know, all that stuff is, is starting down the path. And I know it's hard for you, Canada and BC, to, to think about the third jurisdiction here. So don't worry about things that are not in your jurisdiction, because we're talking about our jurisdiction, and that's our fisheries tenure. And we're talking about access of the public. And that's as simple as that. We can argue all day about technical data, this and that. But the fact is, we're talking about access. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> yeah, I was just sitting here listening. Um, I hear um, concerns about uh, being the observer, and, um, and I think we we have been the observer for a while. And, uh, and, um, and next summer we don't intend to be the observer. And I think, as, as far as um, um, us sitting on this table, the wider group of solitary chiefs put us here. So, so I think we're going to have a room for the hereditary chiefs. And, uh, they're going to sing the same music that we're singing um, because because they are the ones who who gave us the music sheet. So, but, but, so that's what we're doing today. So, um, you know, I, I don't like the prospects of next summer. I, um, um, 
I've been there before, and it's not fun. I know that uh, one of the one of the fish wardens he retired now. He he had to deal with me in the 1975 era, and he was getting groceries behind me one day at the store. And then he says, we, we never talked for years, like, uh, and he said, Art, he said, are you behaving yourself? He said, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I said, yeah, I am, I know. But, but I think, um, oh, yeah, I think we, we, we were we were wanting to let's see see where this goes because um, um, <clears throat> because I think when we talk to government we spin our wheels we just spin our wheels and, and they they say well we observe this we observe that and then uh, when the actual practice on the ground comes uh, it isn't really the case and. Um, and I think we're tired of it. We're really tired of it. And, uh, and, uh, and I think some of the people on the street get mad at us. And, and um, but but when they see the stance the chiefs are taking, they're they're on our side now. So so um, so so I think. If worse comes to worse, like like um, they already know the story. There, uh, there's nothing hidden from them. There, uh, you can see you can see the paper that um, is starting to go out. Like um, <clears throat> I think we're trying to go over and above to uh, inform the people on the street because um, because I think I think. Uh, there are times when, <coughs> when uh, people have misconceptions about us, and uh, and, uh, and I think we're trying to find a way that that, that we are standing on your behalf. Um, we're not like um, and a lot of the things that we do are not fun. It's um, it's um, I think for people like myself. Um, I like to be a nice, kind person, but um, but when they put me in a position of leadership, then I have to change my tune every now and then. And, um, and uh, I just want to thank you guys for listening. I just uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Art. Um, Chaz, comment. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, highlight the importance of timeliness on these discussions and. Um, talking about that competing jurisdiction and the access issues. Um, we're closing the river in 2019 and if these permits are handed out and it's not communicated that uh, it's closed in our territory, we're potentially going down a path where I'm really concerned about our people's safety. Um, We've seen this within the last couple of years, our brothers and sisters downstream trying to close just a segment of their river to food fish <clears throat> and the conflict that ensued because of that. And, you know, I think, it, I think that just highlights the importance of dealing with this stuff right away, right? Because if you guys, if Canada and the province is handing out these permits and we're saying it's closed, who are the people that pay for that permit going to get mad at, right? So there's a big safety issue here, and I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you, Dennis. So we, we've um, talked quite a bit about the terms of reference, and um, I believe Colin and Patty have expressed um, their observations that. Um, Carol, sorry. 
Um, I hope I'm not overstepping my, uh, my, my boundaries in terms of uh, just sharing with you some initial thoughts, but I'm just sitting and listening and observing. Um, and I guess the question that I, that I have, I guess for clarification purposes, is that um, are these terms of reference actually in, in effect? Um, at this point in time, or was it the intent to have it at this table for uh, review and discussion? And if the intent is to um, have Canada and British Columbia um, as potential partners at the table to be a part of this work, um, I could see why they were, they're were they a bit confused because I don't really see in here where they even have a role um, when you look at the, at the team. Um, and so, it's, but that's just my first observation. Um, and secondly, in terms of the fact that the fisheries um, is going to close and time is definitely of the essence, um, it makes sense that you that um, you would look at bringing together um, all of the um, partners that that have some kind of a role to play. And when you're talking about how do you go about educating and creating awareness about um, the the Gitsan's constitutionally protected rights. I think that there's a number of things that could actually happen. I mean, you were talking about signage as, as a possibility. Um, I think when, uh, like, what do you have in terms of information available in your in your offices? And when you issue a permit, what is attached to a permit? Is there information um, from your in your respective regions on the governing First Nation of that territory? Um, is that a part of your your permitting process? Um, and like, there's there's ways of generating awareness um, that uh, could that are easy to do. Um, I was also wondering if um, there was ever uh, the thought of maybe having a joint um, info session or a tripartite info session at the beginning of any of the seasons to provide education to um, those groups that come into your territory, into the regions to uh, partake in recreation or commercial or whatever fishery it may be. Like, you know, is there a chance for, for something like that to happen? Then you, then you deliver the message that you wanna deliver. Um, and I'm just, because I'm not, I haven't been a part of this from the beginning, uh, this is just another question. Um, has there been a, um, a forum of, of all of the uh, First Nations on the Skeena? Um, like typically sometimes when at a leadership council level, when we're going to start tackling a, a, a major issue, uh, we call on the federal and the provincial governments to um, cost resource a forum where we can bring all First Nations from the province together to start having a conversation on a specific matter. I'm just not sure if that was something that happened here already to help you make the determination about closing your fishery. And you actually answered one of my questions in terms of how you've um, already um, hired um, Gitsan River Guardians. And I think that um, more of that would probably you know, help with the monitoring and the regulating of of the permits that are issued i know that um, nationally there was a big conference that was just held on guardians um first nation guardians on all matters and so um you know that's definitely something that first nations are calling for and um where they're in where there are guardians in place um you know conflict lessons and um, it also works towards um, establishing better working relationships between um, First Nations and whether it's the regions or with the general public or whatever the case may be. So just an another um, thought around that. So those are just my observational um, comments. Thank you. Gordon, you want to respond? Yeah, the, uh, it says, and government and others so you know it's, it's open and we're open uh, DFO and BC would step in there with with the proviso that you're not going to let your jurisdiction uh, restrict you and uh, 
say things like rights and title are not our, you know, we, the issue is pretty clear what we're dealing with. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Cheryl, for, for pointing that out. But the intent was not really to re really restrict this process. We want to open it up. It, it's, it's, it's a big issue and it could get really bad quick or it could get really good quick depending on, on us here now. And your other point about uh, your suggestions on the, the guardians and the monitors, those, those are very good. And uh, we come to the table only with the issue of access to the tenure. And we're hoping you would come to the table like Cheryl pointed out what's all involved with the permitting process. What's in there? What's that? Like just that sort of stuff, we don't know about. You're free with the information about how many salmon in the river, but we need to know how is it these people are getting allowed to trespass? Because we're reasonable people. That's all I can remember of your statement, Cheryl. Sorry. Um, thanks, Brian. Uh, just wanted to pick up on your point, Shaz. I'm, I'm, I think safety is a number one consideration as well, and that's where I think guardians can have a role. I think that's where increased communication, particularly, um, go back to NATS and, and traditional fishing sites to lessen um, the potential for conflict. Uh, in regards to safety you know it's if people don't know then it's like I think it is up to the people there doing the traditional activity to inform them and sometimes it'd be easier to say did you read the sign in some ways because it, it it provides more of a basis for um, acknowledging uh, what they're saying as opposed to leaving it to just them defending it and I that's where I was kind of coming from with some of my comments mm -hmm. um, along those lines because um, I, I do agree and I, I you know, I don't want anyone in an unsafe situation, that's for sure. Um, gets in or, or non gets in. And uh, so the, the question around um, issuing fishing licenses, you know, the, the province issues freshwater fishing licenses and there, there's no, there, there are a number of conditions attached and that, that's where, you know, this, this is really the, uh, we just got a new synopsis. These, this is a big book of conditions, really, that governs you know where you can fish, how many fish you can take, those types of things for across the province. Um, there is, you know, um, in areas like I, I feel like a lot of the questions around will the province issue fishing licenses. You know, I I manage, I work with teams that manage um, fisheries, and I I don't feel very well equipped to <clears throat> respond to that question because I. Is it, uh, the question I have, is it felt at this table that that is like a rights and title discussion? And if it is, then I would point to treaty processes to provide direction on that, just as they are in the Lower Skeena. Closures on the Kalem River, that is part of a treaty discussion. And I'm not a treaty negotiator, so I just want to kind of go back, like the reason I'm saying what I'm saying is because there's things that I'm responsible for and whether or not fishing licenses get issued is not that's not one of the things I'm responsible for. So I want to be really clear about that. I believe you do have restrictions to specific areas and timing and stuff in your synopsis. And just like the wildlife synopsis, um, they acknowledge First Nation territories. They have restrictions or check-ins with the, the local um, communities. So I think that could be a venue to address some of this. Um, the topic of signs, you know, if, if we had an unlimited budget, <clears throat> we'd have a lot of signs up and we, we know from the past that they don't always stay there. Um, they get vandalized. Um, it's a lot of time and energy to maintain that. So, um, the other thing I was thinking about too, is we're talking about recreational fishing and you know, from the biology side, when people come into the territories to do scientific studies, they handle our fish 
through fish collection permits, which are paid for and have a lot of conditions and I'm pretty familiar with those and they don't recognize whose territory you're going on or anything like that. So there's a lot of opportunities to get the word out and to be working together, right? Um, so, there are a lot of opportunities to work together, um, and despite Robert's comment about, uh, you know, it looks like government's just delaying things and so forth, that's not the case. We're trying to find practical things we can do moving forward in a, in a timely manner. I, I'm totally with Patty on this and your comment about concerns for safety. Like, this is a really important concern. We don't want this to blow up into some giant conflict. We want to work on this together. Um, and I would suggest there's a, there's a practical step to consider moving forward here today. Could we have a small working group that is looking at options in the short term to try to improve communication and safety as we go into this season. And I say that because just as Patty said, he's, he doesn't have a mandate to stop issuing licenses. It's the same from the federal government's perspective. You can go online and access a fishing license and pay your money and have a uh, a, a fishing license to go and harvest freshwater fish or salmon or salmon in, in streams or in the marine areas and like the ability to stop that opportunity is well beyond our means in the Pacific region even like it's a it's a it's a major deal so our ability to stop issuing licenses isn't there so what can we do Chaz says well look you've got locations, you can do spatial and uh, temporal space and time management options. And we have the development of this year's fishing plan actively being pursued currently. And in that, um, we have proposals to limit Chinook harvesting as before in key areas below the Kalem confluence on the Skeena, and the below the Kispiox, below the Bulkley and the Maurice, and to to limit those areas so that any Chinook that are staging there are, are not impacted to help prevent conservation. We've got proposals to um, limit or restrict harvesting um, of, of salmon in those particular areas, all salmon, and as well um, Chinook harvesting in those key tributary streams in the in the uh, Skeena drainage as well. So there are a number of proposals under under current development that are <coughs> working their way towards um, an approval process to include. I I believe that in the short term we could have we could perhaps <coughs> have some ongoing discussions, maybe a small group that focuses very specifically on specific actions around communication and information and maintaining some dialogue so that we're, we're working as much as we can together on this stuff. Thank you, Colin. <clears throat> I think Robert has a burning comment to share with us. <laughs> <coughs> That's why we have a committee, a small group. To be the committee that's arguing, we want to meet all the 62 chiefs, like Gordy said. You wouldn't get nowhere. And as far as the BC government, they always go back to title and rights. Every time I talk to them, title and rights. Whose fault is that? The BC government is not moving on it. Yet they talk about reconciliation. They're against everything what the natives trying to do. We are the only heritage heritage chief 
nation how to arrest a ban office. You guys can control them, the government. And when we started, this should work on the second. You don't need signs all along the Skeena. People know where the Skeena is. Maybe you put a big sign by the gate, that's where our boundary is. And it's up to the... You could put it in your book where you can't fish, you can't issue your license, you can include Skeena. That way there'll be no conflict because people will know where not to go. You guys got all the butt. Look like my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just wanted to bring that out. Because I'm getting tired of hearing DC with rights and titles, even the magistrates. Well, you guys don't have treaty. Why do we need treaty? Well, we own the, we own the land. And whose laws are they using? European. You guys want to work with good son, you got to learn our laws, period. Okay, yeah, it's Brian. It's time to stop uh, passing the buck. So next we have on our agenda number four, team to set dates for orientation. B, select chairperson, working group sessions. You want to articulate a bit more on that, Gordon? No, um, you asked some questions about what our fish tenure is. You want to see maps and that sort of stuff. We could do that. That will take us about an hour just to get you into it. Because uh, each each site has an adult and all that stuff involved. Histories of the family and that that sort of information, so we'll, we'll keep it to a bare minimum. And uh, like you say, you don't have jurisdiction for stopping the permits, and we, we know that. That's why we stopped the permits, because we have the jurisdiction. And uh, we'll explain that at the orientation. And, uh, and if we get to the situation of selecting a chairperson, or if you're happy with the way Brian's doing, we just want you to feel like you're included. And uh, well, subject to what you have to say about that, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Gordon. Any questions, comments? I don't know why he stuck me in this chairperson. Thinking you your hard time. Just <laughs> threw me in there, man. Right? Oh, Brian, you do such a good job. Yeah. Can we play cool again? No, now you're buttering me up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we can <laughs> move on to communications. Uh, get the message out, get some fisheries tenure, access to tenure. You want to touch on that? Yeah, that's pretty. You have a copy of the, our, our letter that went on Friday. We'll be sending one at least, at least once a month. month. And then we have the uh, YouTube stuff. We'll be taking portions of this today and you may, you may or may not be on there. I, I suppose we should let you look at it before we do much with it. If you're concerned about what you said, but I think you were pretty safe, Colin and uh, Patty. You guys uh, stuck to your mandate, <coughs> jurisdiction, and didn't get us excited about any promise. So, so the communications is is what it is, and uh, we're just in the beginnings of it now. And we're glad to have uh, Cheryl on there as well, so the people can see, just so they can see who, who's coming to meet with the chiefs and what the chiefs are saying. That's about it. <coughs> Number six, uh, Gordon and I have a bit of a discussion, and I would like to table that till the next meeting. Um, as we, we've covered quite an extensive
piece of the um, fish tenure for the Gitsan that um, there's, there's a lot that uh, we have in hand and um, a lot that the, the province and the DFO brings to the table. And, um, but at the end of the day, uh, we, we are the Gitsan, we are here, we have the fish tenure and we want to take it a step further and ensuring that our anat or another another word used for anat is unusual which means encompassing everything that we do in our fish camps and uh, ensuring that uh, a lot is taken care of for our families for our wealth members our uh, under the wood sometimes or far the side and, and anyone that we feel requires some help and I, I say that uh, with a lot of sincerity we have we have a fishing site that uh, we've learned from our uncles our grandfathers how to use that site. We've learned when and where we will produce fish for our families. <coughs> and we, we have shared the overabundance when we have it. Because we all know that every once in a while, um, a run comes through and uh, man it takes two and a half hours to clean a net off and two boat trips back to shore because our little 14 foot skiff gets too full of fish and we'd rather save it and save our members from the boat sinking and we'd most definitely share it with our community and share it with our elders because all too often not, I would have to say at this point, not many sites are sometimes active and we need to ensure that our um, older people in our community, our leaders have fish in their freezers, fish in their smoke houses. And we know all of them are very, very active. They don't, they don't stop, you know, they walk slowly, but they, they produce the best smoked fish ever because they've done it over and over and over. So at this time, I want to maybe um, ask um, comments um, from uh, each one of you before we um, close the day off. Um, and um, start off on our on our weekend. So um, before we do that, Bobby has raised his hand to make a short comment. <coughs> you can't do that for you, man. We just want to ask you, uh, you call to uh, meet with the Minister of Fisheries. You don't want to hear that speech from BC. We're willing to go to Vancouver, Victoria, even now. Now I want to go back to uh, number five. I thought uh, Brian was going to ask us any questions, communications. Now a suggestion that uh, BC could use that synopsis to get out the message that the Skeena is close to recreation of fishing 2019. That would be a good way of letting the people know what's going on. That way there'll be less friction amongst the ones who's uh, against everything what we're trying to do here. And uh, the sooner we get an answer regarding that meeting with the Minister of Fisheries, the 
better. Like you said, we're willing to go to Vancouver, Victoria, even Ottawa. If we can get the help, uh, either one of the expense. <coughs> so there you go, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Robert. Any response? Um, yeah, Robert, um, I, I just mentioned uh, prior to getting back together that uh, um, there is a uh, process that's available in order to contact the minister's office. I will make sure that uh, we provide um, maybe to Gordon or to Brian um, uh, directions on how to, how to, who to talk to and how to access the minister's office um, because um, uh, I, I, I can't submit a request for you to meet the minister directly. It's, it's to come from you and it goes to the minister's office. It bypasses the bureaucracy. It goes straight to the minister's office as the, as the politician. And uh, once that's there, typically the request, then, well not the request, but a comment, a search for comment comes back to the bureaucracy. And we get a chance to say, yes, we've met with this group three <coughs> times. And yes, they've indicated they'd like to meet with the minister and so on. So we make our comment then, but the process is that uh, you independently go to the the minister and request. Only a half hour. So we'll do a round table and uh, any volunteers to start or do you want me just to point out where to start? Vernon? I just want to thank the uh, representatives from the federal and the pro provincial. Uh, just want to uh, just have uh, two comments, I guess. Uh, one of them is a safety issue. Uh, it's our culture or, and that versus the uh, trespass, uh, license trespass. We have a beautiful section. Between here and uh, Terrace, between Kiranga and Terrace, it's a beach, beautiful beach. Uh, that's where we have our um, uh, smokehouse, and our, uh, about four, four cabins, and a nice house there. And uh, we've been. We've been there since uh, early 60s and uh, we always have a challenge by the, by the recreational fishermen. They throw their hook right, right outside our beach area. The fish there, we try to chase them away and they ignore us. Until, until they see that we're going to force them out, then they finally leave. Good thing it hasn't escalated uh, yet, but it will somewhere down the road. I'm concerned about the uh, safety issues there, because even though they know they cannot uh, do any recreation fishing where we are, we have our net out there. They still come and challenge us. We have about, out of a hundred uh, recreation fisheries, uh, <coughs> fishermen, they, there's easily about half a dozen of them challenge us every summer. So I would like to see this uh, get iron out there. <coughs> First, we don't want to reach into our own traditional law to deal with it. If we do, then there's going to be court cases happening. That's our law. Another one is uh, we have a share, uh, talking to the uh, federal, we have a share. The Gitschans have a one third share on the uh, <coughs> Northern Native Fishing Corporation and uh, uh, 
I hear the minister may have a church of common in our area. Uh, if that happens, I want uh, us to deal with uh, Northern Native Fishing Corporation. Uh, uh, part of it will be will be this, they should be on the agenda if the fishers share because we have one third. I'm concerned about that because I sit on a board and we have uh, 250 so out licenses, 57 or 56 commercial licenses. And we pay uh, probably 750 per license each year, whether it's used or, or, or shelf for the summer, we still pay even if it's shelf. And that agreement is, a, is a, an agreement that that was there when they first started. And we would like to, as part of the board, we would like to revisit the agreement because uh, of the amount of uh, uh, fishermen that are involved. They hear the prediction and they don't come to the office to pay for the licenses. So we end up paying 750 for unused licenses. And, and our savings are dwindling. Uh, it's one of those uh, agreement that's set for failure down the road. I guess our leaders back then didn't didn't look too far in the future to to address that. Uh, commercial commercial sector is going down the drain and. Uh, because of a mismanagement to begin with. And, uh, uh, that's where we're at with uh, Northern Native Fishing Corporation. I'd like to see that, uh, I, I would like to see them get involved if the minister comes in our area, or maybe even Vancouver. Uh, I, I know that we're willing to go down there too, give us a little bit of time just to address uh, what we're facing. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to say that uh, I'm honored to sit at this table, um, to be able to have the opportunity to do the good work uh, for my nation and for my son to get. Um, I like the collaboration that's happening right now with Canada and the province. I'd really like to thank Cheryl for coming and speaking the kind words and the strong words that you said today. Um, I grew up in Terrace. Uh, my mom's French Canadian. My dad's Gitsan. My grandma went to a residential school in Prince Rupert. My dad left Hispiox when he was really young. <laughs> He never got taught much about, or anything really, about the gets and laws and the culture. And it wasn't until I, <clears throat> I was a young adult that I really even learned about being Gitsan. And, and I always had a, um, a deep connection that I wanted to <coughs> learn more and be a part of the nation. And so in the last few years, I've changed my career path and changed where I live. and what we're doing and everything in my life to be a part of this. So, thank you. Thank you, Charles. <coughs> I think it's uh, going good. Um, You know, when, when you're negotiating, um, there are some uh, really strong issues that you have to address. And um, <clears throat> it's not, you know, as if, I mean, everybody around the table has, you know, has got to have strong skin, you know, and can't take it personally. Um, because, uh, what we're talking about is a people who have been oppressed all their lives 
And the issue here is how are you going to deal with this oppression? And one of the oppressions is that um, the restrictions placed on the fish. And um, I know that the government has not closed their doors on what we're saying. <clears throat> you know, it's really nice to hear from the different perspectives, especially from this lady sitting here. Um, the spirituality of our land, the spirituality of the fish, These are not minor little things that we're talking about. It is our lives that we're talking about. The very essence of our being. We are salmon people. And that is not going to be denied. It is our spirit. It's really good to be sitting here with all of you. So, the doors open, you know, this is our land. This is our land, we open the doors. But we want to see a conservation of our fish for our future generations. That means that sustainability has to be practiced. When I talk about sustainability, I'm not talking about the resource that is going to be depleted. I'm talking about sustainability <clears throat> of our people. Our people have to be sustained on this land for thousands and thousands of years to come. And they have to be here. That is what sustainability is to me. And it'll be nice if everybody else thought the same. Anyways, you know, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Norah. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, Brian, Armin, Jess, and uh, Brian. Um, yeah, I think we have had some uh, useful conversations here, um, and um, I absolutely appreciate the comments that you're making. I, I, I hear you about the connection to the land, the cultural connection that's required. Like the sustainability is more than fish, it's your connection to the fish and the, and the land. I, it's a point is, is key. So I say again, we have a lot in common and we have lots of reasons to carry on conversations. The uh, commitment to trying to ensure that the fish are available for your use is there and um, a real commitment, it, not a, just me talking about it, the department is committed to trying to make sure that happens. So we've got to find the conversation to keep that uh, keep that going and keep that alive. Um, there's some difficult uh, issues to face, as you know, to, to make that happen. Um, and uh, um, I think the key is being able to keep working together on this. A kind of spirit of collaboration where we try to solve these problems as best we can together there's things we can do there's things you can do and there's things others can do but if we keep focused on that we can keep making progress so that's that's our commitment we want to find ways to move forward and uh, and I'm uh, encouraged by the uh, the idea of trying to um, identify specific communication steps that we can make. We can make. You can make. Together we can try to make some progress. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Paul. 
I just want to say thank you again for welcoming us into your territory and for the conversation and uh, for, I guess, honoring and trusting us with your stories. That's the part I always enjoy the most. Um, I'm involved in a lot of collaborative processes and I, I know that the hard conversations are the ones that get us the most meaningful outcomes, so uh, we'll continue to have them. and. I think part of the department's commitment is we'll be continue to be honest about what we can do, so which will sometimes be frustrating, but what we're committed to being honest about that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you, Fidua, uh, for being here, and uh, I'd like to say thank you to a special guest down down below. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and I'm glad to be a part of this. And, and these kind of uh, situations are historic. And, um, and I think if, uh, if we can find um, solutions that would satisfy our, our, our stance as Native people kind of thing, and uh, um, because I think uh, I think for the longest while we've been very tolerant and, and uh, but every once in a while we have to get up and see there's something wrong here, we've got to fix it and uh, so that's where we're at and I'm glad there's movement and towards that and, uh, and thank you again for being here. Yep. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. This is uh, our third meeting, and it's uh, it is an honor to be here. Some uh, guests, I appreciate and honor the feedback shared with the province. I have learned a lot over the last three meetings. Uh, I've learned a lot through the Gitsan training that we recently took, and I feel like a bit about what I talked about today was what I can't do, but I am excited about what we can do and one of the things I'm I'm excited about is is sharing the information that I have learned and I think about our discussions on uh, you know the, the, the fishing sites the importance of these areas of um, desires on the way that these areas are managed and also that way that gets and lands are managed and I have a role as a public servant to um, to share some of this information. I take that seriously. And you're helping me in that position um, by sharing the information and and uh, and I appreciate that. So I do I look forward to the specifics uh, that Colin was mentioning around uh, some of the you know steps that we can take together about increasing that knowledge and through, through communication, communication with, with that, that public. public. Uh, uh, in particular what we can do you know prior to the uh, upcoming fishing season. So Thank you. Well, I um, first of all want to uh, let you know how much of an honor it is to have been able to sit at this table and to witness what I call um, Gitsan traditional governance in action. And that's you know basically what it is, recognizing that there's a problem and that you need to bring the appropriate people to together to try to come up with some solutions. And I see you know that that is what um, you're attempting to do here through this important work. Um, I know that um, you've said you were wanting to get a hold of ministers and have a meeting, if possible, here in your territory or wherever uh, may be the best place. And that I just want to extend to you our our. Um, uh, support and being able to do that as well through the First Nation Summit Office if you so choose and want us to try to assist in any way that's that's what we're here for so um, either or whether Colin sends the information or work through our office Gordon um, you know best how to contact us um, and I just uh, want to acknowledge you know the efforts that um, you you're currently um, putting into play in terms of trying to protect um, a resource that is very important um, for not only just for sustenance but also the linkages to spirituality and to culture and tradition and language right so 
Um, I hold my hands up to you for that. And my in my nation, when we sit down with governments and we start talking about uh, fisheries uh, management or wildlife management, one of the things that we always do to correct them is to say, um, the only ones that can manage the fish and manage the, the elk and the deer is the creator. All we can do really is to manage the human impacts to the fisheries or to the wildlife and their habitat. And so I think it's, a, it's, it's also an exercise of changing that mindset as well so that you can start coming, looking at it from that perspective. And I think then maybe you're gonna be able to have more success in coming up with some plans and some options to support that very important work. And again, thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to be here. Um, and if there's anything further that myself or my colleagues, the um, executive of the summit can do to help in any way, please do not hesitate to call upon us. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. <coughs> Mark? Um, this this is my first meeting here. Oh, yes, for sure. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my first meeting here, it's been great to, to kind of listen to, to to what everyone has to say. Um, I think that's one of the very first steps for, for reconciliation is to gain a better understanding um, of each other. And I, I would say that that's, you know, why we have representatives from, from various governments here. Um, it's complicated. There's lots of bureaucracy. There's things that take a lot of time um, to change to get to maybe where we want to get to. Um, but there are some things that we can do now or in the near future and, and hopefully we can work together towards <coughs> creating some of the solutions and um, while we work towards those, those longer term visions and goals. So thank you again for letting me be here and um, look forward to other meetings. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank the people from Fred's BC and Cheryl. It's nice having you here. It is a very good meeting as far as I understand. <coughs> and the only thing I can say to the call do what we can for you. Don't try, do it. Once you made up your mind, you do it, you can do it. And a short term agreement don't usually work that much. If you want more time, we can start right from there. But right now, we're just starting this. Our fish is in dire straits. Like I said to you, Newfoundland lost or caught fishing because of mismanagement. And I don't want to see that happen here in BC. Something has to be done right away. And I suggest that to get the communication to the people, especially the recreational people who want to come here, to put it on your synopsis. This is off limits be easily done by the government. You guys got the funds. That way there'll be less friction between the Gitsan people and the, there's lots of rednecks there. Some of them can carry weapons because I've seen them across the river. Again, I thank all the uh, Shabogits, Elaine and uh, guest a very good meeting as far as I'm concerned and like you said we're we're good people but don't get us angry <laughs> thank you Talk about fish, it reminded me of the very first salmon I caught as a young boy. The very first, and, uh, it is a coho 
maybe about a four pound coho and man I was so proud I didn't live too far from the river probably about a quarter of a mile that was carried a fish in the, the gill and I carried it up brought it home mom and dad were home and I showed them it. I said, good catch. I took the fish and uh, got in the truck. I took it halfway down the, down the street and uh, they gave it to uh, um, an elderly couple there, James and Amelia Angus. And I was thinking, why did you give my fish away? I said, oh my God, I was, I was crushed. They gave my fish away. I was so proud. I thought we were going to cook it up and have it. They gave it away. And my mom told me later, that we are so proud of you for catching your very first fish. And this is what we do. We, we, we give it. We give it away because it's your first fish. So it's all that's been in the back of my mind. This, going through my mind over and over and over again that my mom and dad gave away my very first fish I was so happy and I thought we were going to eat them. And that's the, the, the power and the strength of our culture, our, culture, our traditions, our ayok. This is what we do. And th the message here is we're, we're looking at the the sports fishermen, the, the fishing permits that are put out there, you know, the, uh, the importance of the fisheries tenure that we take care of. And I hope that uh, the, the um, message that we're, we're putting out to the Simgiget, the crisis management team have articulated to you in, in their own words of the importance, the, the, the way of our lives. It, it just gets right straight to the heart because that's what we are, that's who we are, and that's how we, how we care for our, our, our people, our children. The children that we have that are not here yet. We are their instruments. I look at that in my sense. And I want to thank uh, Colin and uh, Amy for coming uh, to this meeting and uh, thank Patty, and especially thank you Cheryl for coming here and Mark of course. And there's some dig yet here that have, have worked really hard to uh, represent up to 38 chiefs and there are more coming. You know, we, we, we need to ensure, that, uh, we need to make sure that we are on the same page and this is what we're doing. And this is a start of a small portion of uh, a team of the Sydney Get of the Get people. And I also thank the guidance that uh, Gordon brings to the table for the Simge Get, as he is one of the Simge Get, he is Lukajewas. And the importance of the work that we have conducted here today is, I look at it as a step in the right direction. And, uh, again, Toyak Sam Nisum Simge Get, Toyak Sam Kabit Anar Stop Sam Lukajewatum Ayok. I am touched very deeply and I, and I thank you for allowing me to be um, the chairperson for the day. Maybe tomorrow too, who knows, you know. Anyway, and uh, I'd like to ask uh, we will those to uh, close or not. We're going to send it <coughs> for the next one. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, thank you, Norman. Mm -hmm.